Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Max Marty, that will talk about some of the most interesting aspects of our business plan and about the strategic approach that we are utilizing. Thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, make this somewhat brief. And the reason for that is that I'm, I'm much more, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in actually getting to the question and answer session and seeing what, what sort of things you guys can, can hit us with over at Blue Seed. Uh, this is a, uh, definitely one of the most connected audiences to, to the subject, so I'm, I'm very interested in your questions and I'm looking forward to that. But, uh, but here let's run through some of the interesting data and some interesting conclusions and strategies that we've used um, uh, over at Blue Seed, and I, I think you guys will agree it's, uh, it's, it's definitely, definitely worth it. So we mentioned before the, uh, the panel, the data on the number of companies that have expressed interest in being on board Blue Seed. Now, everybody um, who did this went through uh, what we call our startup survey of interest. And what that means is uh, you have to fill out that you are working with a particular startup. You have to tell us a bit about what your startup is doing, who's, uh, what, what's the funding situation, how many people are on your team, when are you looking to move? How interested are you in moving? Obviously, if you're not interested, then you shouldn't be filling out the survey. Um, and uh, and it, uh, we also then, of course, get things like country data. It's, it's basically market research. Because at the end of the day, if you are running a startup and we say we're going to be launching in end of 2013 or beginning of 2014, uh, that's, that, that's kind of a strange thing, timeline to be working with when you're a startup. Startups have to move quickly. And uh, they, might, they may not be around at that time. They may have scaled beyond the size which Blue Seed could accommodate. Uh, or, um, or, uh, or they may not exist. So um, as, as said before, this is actually more recent data. So we have here that the US is actually a little more than a quarter of the representation now. Now, sometimes these numbers have to be essentially trimmed because there's some companies that we don't like to keep on there. Uh, and actually, I'll mention more about this in a little bit, but there are some, some types of companies that we essentially have to reject pretty early on. Uh, so I don't know if, I don't know if we've looked at this, oh, sorry. I don't know if we've looked at this specific data in the, uh, in the past week to trim it down some more, but, but that, will have to be, that will have to be done soon. Um, anyway, you see here that US is first, India, UK, Australia, Canada, Spain, Germany, etc. cetera. Um, then on the next page, all the way down to a couple from, uh, one from Romania, Indonesia, Hungary, etc. There's uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of interesting stuff there. So then we have this other question, which is how important are various factors on when coming aboard Blue Sea? And like Dario said, ooh, that's back one way. Oh, interesting. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah, okay, so how important are various factors when moving on to Blue Sea? And uh, oddly enough, like Dario said, the, motive, the main motivation for a lot of these people is that aspirational goal. It's the idea of you can come on board and be in a curated environment of really awesome startups from all around the world doing really interesting stuff. And a number of these, another one of the, the sort of things we ask is, of course, what, what kind of company are you coming on board with? And uh, we do get the usual so uh, software companies, mobile, social, locals, etc. Uh, but we've gotten a number of AI companies, uh, some robotics companies, some nanotech companies, some biotech companies. And I think that's very important in helping to create an environment that's stimulating, an environment that's bringing in new and different ideas and seeding the space with cool stuff. And I think that's very important to our clientele. And, and obviously, a lot of people find that a very high value, which is why that is the primary motivation of living in a really cool live-work environment. Now, obviously, the visa motivation is still important, but it's more like a checkbox. Okay, yes, I can now come on board Blue Seed, rather than what actually inspires people to be on board Blue Seed. Um, so uh, there's other questions like how soon would you move, whether you would move immediately in three to six months, etc. Um, and then there's, uh, there's data on, for example, how many team members would be on board. Uh, you can see, uh, in case you can't see it, um, most of the teams would be about two or three people. Then we all have a few that are trailing off into five or ten or et cetera. Um, now, the, of course, the constraint on board Blue Seed is when you get to a certain size, it'll be required, essentially, that you need to move off at some point. 
Now, are we going to say that specifically when you reach a certain number of, of, uh, of individuals on board working with your company, or when you reach a certain amount of funding, when you've been there a certain de length of time? We haven't had that. We haven't gotten to that specific. But um, of course, if you if you say it's when you reach a certain number of people working on your team, then what will happen is they'll get to that number, 15, and then you'll see that everything else is kind of being outsourced. And they're growing and growing, but not quite growing on board, and it'll be this weird... In other words, they game any sort of metric you specifically try to measure. So you have to come up with a package of, of things that you'd use in order to uh, determine when is best for them to, to move off. Now, of course, it's in our interest that they eventually do move off. Because as we take that equity portion in each of these companies, it's in our in interest that they have eventually a liquidity event of some sort, whether that's an acquisition or whether that's an IPO or, or some other way that we can uh, essentially cash out of that venture. So uh, that's, uh, that, that's going to be in our interest to figure, out, to figure that out. Now, um, here's some of the ships we're looking at, in case you're curious about that. Uh, so <clears throat> what's this first one? Actually, the funny thing is I don't see an end. Okay. Um, anyway, so we're looking at. Uh, that's the oceanic. That's the oceanic. It's the oh, bottom right. It's the bottom right. Oh, it's in black. Well, that figures. Okay, so that's the oceanic. Um, so there's a range of prices here on vessels. There's vessels between uh, that we're looking at between about ten million on the very low end to about you can go I and mean, you can spend. I mean, I, I don't have the slide here, but there's one that we're looking at that's actually two hundred million. Right, that's on our database. Now that one is uh, highly unlikely to be the final candidate just because of that enormous capital cost. But, but, uh, but these are ships that are within a particular range. What's that range? It's between around a thousand, uh, a thousand or so passengers that can you can have on board to about two thousand passengers on board. Now the magical thing about this number is that cruise lines have essentially grown beyond this size. So cruise lines are getting bigger and bigger. If you think about um, the, uh, the, the newest ships um, coming out by, for example, Royal Caribbean, they can have about uh, five or 6,000 passengers or so and then some thousands of crew. Oh, I keep hitting this microphone. Uh, some thousands of crew. And uh, the smaller ships, uh, these are essentially classified as medium-sized vessels, uh, they're not economically viable anymore. Uh, the economies of scale just aren't there with these size of vessels to make it worth it. So this is a buyer's market, essentially. Uh, if anybody else is looking to do a seastead, there's enough of these out there that I'm not worried about you like taking the one that we wanted here. Um, you know, please feel free to look into this market. This is a uh, this is definitely a good time to be on the on the market. Um, so uh, here's actually here's my personal favorite. It's the Island Escape. It's 50 million. This ship used to be a used to be a a, um, a car ferry uh, a while ago but it was converted into a full normal cruise ship. It doesn't have any space for cars anymore. And uh, it it's definitely has the advantage of size. So this one has enough cabins in it. So if, you, if you're going to have 1,000 individuals on board who are entrepreneurs, some number of crew, and then some of sort of odd things that you want to add in there. For example, you want to have research institutes in there. You want to have other groups in there. Uh, then you want a ship that's significantly bigger than the total passenger size you're looking for because you're going to be converting a number of those cabins into, in our case, office space, right? No cruise ship comes with office space, the, the amount of office space that we're going to need already built in. So you're going to be paring down the total number of cabins, and, uh, and, and that's, going to affect, um, that's going to affect the sort of size of cruise ship that you're looking at. Um, so you can see this one has, uh, you know, this, this one's 50 million in, our, in this case, and for us, we're going to be... Uh, so buying a cruise ship is a lot like buying a house. Uh, you get a mortgage. You go to a bank, you get a loan, you put a deposit down, you put a certain amount of, of down payment, and uh, then you pay interest on that loan for a while, etc. Uh, so in this case, it's a $50 million ship. You put 20% down, it's $10 million. You have to spend another uh, amount of money retrofitting it, renovating to your needs, and, and then you have essentially a workable, a workable space for a, for a seastead. Here's another one. Um, that's the Atlantic Star, uh, similarly priced to the... To the uh, to the uh, um, to the island escape, and uh, of course there is op always the option to actually build something from scratch, or or it's mostly from scratch, essentially using some existing blueprints and coming up with something new. And our concept vessels are exactly that. We uh, we said to everybody who was designing these concept vessels, okay, we want you to use a space that's essentially a barge, uh, a flat top, and then put on top of that anything that you think would be awesome, and then we worked with them to come up with a really cool set of designs. 
Now the, the, the advantage here is of course when you use a custom space you can do a lot more with it. You can, you can really have it suited to your needs. Uh, the problem is cost. Um, so I, I say here 100 million for something that looks a lot like a normal ship. But uh, if we were to build some of those concept vessels, it, it, would, it would potentially be even a lot more than that. So um, uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that is something that if, if somebody has incredibly deep pockets and is looking to start a seastead, you can go for it, but, uh, but it's probably not an incremental step. Now, um, you know, we still like to keep it there because there's a lot of people who are inspired by that vision. And of course, if somebody's willing to write the check, that's, that's just fine. But... Uh, but uh, uh, it's probably going to be, in our case, something more like the ships you just saw. So um, now I want to talk about what I'm calling the real secret to starting a sea setting company. All right, here it is. It's coming up. Everybody, hold your breath. It's coming. First one, money. OK. All right. So we all know that, uh, that uh, in, this, in this sense, I'm saying this in two ways. First, obviously, you need to have funding. That's, that, that goes without saying. But it's actually it's, it's more important than that. You need to have a business model that makes sense. You need to have a business model that's not just profitable, but very profitable. Why? Because you're fighting, you're, you're swimming upstream here. You're trying to convince people of an idea that hasn't been done in almost any way, shape, or form, save for the existing cruise line industry. And they're going to look at you with sort of cross eyes and figure, what, what in the world is this person talking about? So it's only when you start saying, look, you're going to be able to make like a hundred times the money you put in. Then, then they start listening, of course, and they think you're crazy. But um, you, so you have to you have to be very careful in how you balance all these aspects, and you have to uh, you have to come up with a story that makes sense financially and is demonstrating that your idea, even in its early and incremental steps, can be highly profitable. Uh, so this is um, this goes without saying. But I can't. I'm not going to say too much more about this subject because, frankly, a lot of different business models uh, vary a lot in regards to how they approach this subject, and and you're going to hear a lot more about this from people who are more well-versed in the other business models at this point than, than I am. Now, number two, politics. So that is the second, uh, but, uh, but no means uh, less important of the two. And uh, notice here that what I'm not saying is all that important at this incremental step. Uh, you know, uh, apologies to George, uh, you know, uh, director of engineering at uh, TSI, but um, is the things like engineering questions. So a lot of the engineering questions, at least in our case, have been solved or were solved uh, to a sufficiently good degree uh, early on. And for example, is it possible to moor in the waters we're looking to moor in at the depth we're looking to moor in with a vessel of the type we're looking at? Yes. Is it expensive? Yeah, it's pretty expensive, but it's not, it's not, it's not uh, infeasible when it comes to fin financially. Right? It costs a few million dollars, possibly more. Let's say it costs $10 million. That's still not financially infeasible, and it won't cost more than that. So um, can these vessels that we're looking at withstand the ocean and the, and the sort of systems uh, that, that are present in the environment we're looking at? Yes, they can. They have to be of a certain length and a certain size or you lose your cookies on there every day, which would certainly not make for a uh, pleasant startup experience. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't be able to work on Blue Seed if I was throwing up every day. So it has to be of a certain size. It has to be of a certain comfort level. And, uh, but yes, these are all problems that have been solved. Perhaps even some of the more interesting ones like how do you get internet connections on board, etc.? Those are all also, compared to money and politics, fairly trivial problems. Again, they're not, uh, in an absolute sense, trivial. They're still difficult to, to deal with, but they're in a, in, a, in a comparative sense trivial. All right, so politics, the more interesting one. This is the one I want to delve into a little bit because our strategy here has been very interesting. Now, there are six prongs to this strategy. Number one is to actually create a business plan, a business model, that is broadly palatable to a broad base of individuals and people in the host country that you're going to be near, which is most important, but also around the world, because you don't want uh, you don't want your business you know you don't you don't want to start a sea setting business next to North Korea and be palatable to North Korea. Well, that'll get you really far soon um, when you want to expand. So in our case, um, that has been to actually create a business that most people. Uh, unless you're, you're essentially a, a crazy coming out of the, the woodwork somewhere, uh, most people think, wow, when, when they hear that uh, entrepreneurs want to come to this country, they want to start new companies, they want to create jobs, they want to create a better economy, they want to help themselves to, to enrich the world, they want to create new technologies, but they're not being allowed to do so. 
once people actually understand that, it's almost impossible to find somebody who's against what we're doing, uh, which is very, very good. So you want to, if you're working on a seasetting company, find something that is of that nature. Find something, whether it's in aquaculture, if it's in medicine, um, find a way to market it, to station it, uh, that is actually going to be palatable to almost everyone. Now, um, uh, somebody might say, well, you know, if I'm starting a, a seaset out in the middle of the Pacific, then this isn't really applicable because uh, who cares? You know, the, even the U.S. is not, unless I'm like uh, killing kittens or something, the U.S. is not going to come out to the middle of the Pacific and, and stop me. Well, that might be the case. But uh, honestly, if you're starting a seaset in the middle of the Pacific right now, uh, I would say there's probably something wrong with your business model. You're probably not going to be making a lot of money. And I, I, I'd love to be proven wrong. Please show me the data. But, uh, but I find that um, you need to be next to some sort of economic powerhouse if you intend to uh, make a lot of money, which, like I said before, in the money problem is, is, is important. So uh, be palatable. And, and don't, don't just pretend. Do something that is actually palatable. You can't, you can't uh, pretend here. So uh, second is don't stray from that. So you will be tested here. Remember I mentioned previously that there were some individuals who contacted us uh, with, with startup ideas. They filled out our startup survey. They have a legitimate company. Um, but for example, they might be doing something for, uh, in financial services. And hey, don't get me wrong. I think financial services are great. But in our case, that would probably be too dangerous. So if you are doing something that's the next, uh, the next uh, Bitcoin and you want to do it on board, that's, that's awesome, but you're not going to do it on board Blue Seed because uh, unfortunately there's just too much, uh, too much political risk there. Uh, it, it, uh, it, could affect, it could affect really everything, right? The, you know, the, the Blue Seed could, could die on the, on the table in that case and, and that, would, that wouldn't help anybody. So we have to be very conscious of that risk. Uh, and you should be too. So stick to your model. Don't let other people stray you from it. Number three, address interest groups and create as much of a big tent as you can given your model. Now, um, what do I mean here? So for example, uh, find a way to make your business, uh, and again, you can't pretend here, you actually have to build this into the fabric of what you're doing. Find a way to make your business um, include the environmental movement. So make, make your Seastead a shining example, not just, not just complying with the regulations that are necessary, a shining example of what it's like to live an environmentally, environmentally sustainable life on board. Will it cost you more? Yes. Will it be worth it? Almost certainly. So um, look for those sorts of supporters. Uh, basically, you want them to get behind you very early on and to help uh, to feel like they've had a voice in your company as it develops. And if that's the case, they'll be, they're much more likely to be behind you when you're actually out there in the ocean rather than uh, you getting a phone call from them later on and they say, oh, I just spoke to congressman such and such and person so and so, and uh, I'm really rallying a cause against you here. That would be bad. So um, I, I strongly suggest to go out and try to find as many people as you can to, to, uh, to stand behind you rather than beside you or in front of you when the case, when the when push comes to shove. All right, number four, um, good relationships with policymakers themselves. So not just the interest groups, but go out and proactively speak. If you're starting one in, the, in, in near, uh, near Spain, there is uh, certainly you know, a lot of people you can be connecting with there. In our case, we're starting one uh, right here off the coast of San Francisco. So we are, try, we are connecting with congressmen uh, and, and women here in the Silicon Valley area. We're connecting with people in uh, the federal level. And the only one we haven't made as many inroads with is at the state level, but we're certainly looking to do that. We've even gone all the way down to the town of uh, Half Moon Bay and spoken with a lot of individuals there, spoken at the Rotary Club. It's very important to have a, a, a positive relationship with, with legislators. Um, number five is to have a good relationship, not just with those policymakers, but with the government agencies themselves. Again, even if you don't intend to be right next to Silicon, uh, to uh, the U.S.'s coastline or some country's coastline, uh, they do have ways of being able to mess with your business, even if you are completely legal. If you say, but look, it says right here, I'm, I'm doing everything by the book, and they don't like what you're doing, they will find a way to shut you down. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, what are examples? Well, let's say that, um, let, for in our, in our case, we have to run a supply chain back and forth 
from the San Francisco area to the ship and uh, moving everything from uh, filet mignon to toilet paper. So when, you, uh, when you're doing that, let's say some, some uh, particular government agency doesn't like what you're doing, oh, it just could, you know, it's true what you're doing is by the book, but it could just take a really long time to get those permits. I'm sorry, things, it's hard to expedite these kind of things, you know? So there you go. You can do it a lot of damage to a business model just with that. So again, positive relationships with government agencies is, is very important. Uh, Customs and Border Protection in our case, uh, yeah, United States Customs and, and, and um, Immigration Services, State Department, uh, Coast Guard, St uh, Homeland Security, you know, the list goes on. All right, and what's the sixth and final one here is good media exposure and a lot of openness. So you have to actually get in front of cameras, not be shy about doing so, and say, look, what I'm going to be doing, not even when you've already done it, but what I'm going to be doing is very positive. You emphasize the importance of the business model, how it's going to be helping people, how it's a win-win situation for everyone concerned. You answer their questions, you, you address their, their, their concerns, and, uh, and, and they, will, they, will, uh, they will help you out rather than, rather than again, being a hindrance to, to your idea in the future. So with, uh, without further ado, I uh, would like to now leave it up to questions for, for myself or Dario or, or Sam, if you'd like to, to come up as well and, and answer anything, please do. about the people or the companies outgrowing Blue Seed. And um, I wanted to ask, first of all, where would they go if, uh, if they were going to move somewhere else? Um, and, and second, just in the same vein, I mean, it's not obvious to me that people would have to move. Like, why not get another ship or just keep scaling up? Um, the I could address maybe. Will you guys answer to that, Mike, so we can record yeah. it? I take just, uh, do you want to take? Oh. Sure. Please. 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 Uh, I mean, one of the basic idea, ideas here is that Silicon Valley is so unique. So if you want to scale a company, this is the place to be. So when we say outgrow our facility, it doesn't, doesn't mean necessarily that they would have to come to Silicon Valley. Nobody's going to force them. But I think it would be the, in their interest to do so. And they would be able to do that because once you have enough funding, you can obviously open an office here. And some of the founders or co-founders or early employees would be able to reintroduce themselves legally to Silicon Valley via existing channels, such as business uh, H1B or L1. L1 probably yeah. would be the better. So that's the that's the kind of the, the, the foundation of why we say that would be in their interest to outgrow our facilities if you want to scale. I mean, why did Facebook come here? Because sure. of the engineers, et cetera. It's just like if, if the founder has visa problems, then, then you could be on Lucy and there could still be an office on sure. land. And I mean, certainly, I agree that. And then office, would be able to reach. Yeah. Good, 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 good let me but, let me add a so, USCIS, which is the department in charge of a lot of the visa issues here, uh, they will take you more seriously uh, when you have a larger company, okay. when you're more well funded. So when you're when you're at a very small level, they essentially yeah. ignore you. They say, "Well, this is some kind of fraud. What are you? You're, you're running a startup. What are you doing?" And then when you get to a certain amount of funding, you have 20 people, you have a bunch of, then they, they actually look at your application seriously and can grant you an H-1B and other things. So that's, that's the main point here. John? Guys, you have made tremendous progress on your plan since the last time I heard it, three or six months ago. So congratulations on that. I like nothing better than to get on board a cruise ship with my laptop and work on some project that I've got going without interruption. The fewer ports of call, the better. So I think of myself as a target customer for your services. And I've got to believe there are other entrepreneurs like me who like getting on a cruise ship and, and just working without interruption on some project. It seems to me that uh, it would be good to hear about the way that you can most de-risk this project. For example, uh, there's some cruise ships which go out for three days from Long Beach and don't go anywhere. They just go out for people to party and drink and then come back. Um, could you rent out a cruise ship like that for three days, one week, one month uh, to demonstrate uh, the effectiveness of this? What would be the minimum size of ship and number of days of existing of a, of a, a, a cruise ship of a blue sea, of a sea stead that you'd have to do? 
You know, a model to emulate, I think, is Atlantis Events. I think I've mentioned it to you before. It is hugely profitable. Uh, they uh, lease uh, cr existing cruise ships from companies like Holland America. Holland America continues to handle all of the uh, logistics, the, the uh, running of the ship. They just do the, the reservations and the events. And uh, so, uh, and that lets them focus on their value add and not have to worry about the, uh, the, a lot of things that they don't have any expertise in. So uh, it seems to me it's gonna take some experimentation to discover what is uh, the right customer for this. And, and you want to be out there trying, reaching out to different customers like me or other or real startups uh, and I, I think you need to hurry because I think you're going to have some competition. The, the, by doing it in a way that has lower barriers to entry, not trying to raise $25 million to buy a ship, but just focusing sort of on the virtual aspects of the business, uh, I, it, it seems to me others may well think of this too and, and, and try it. Um, so I think, John, what you're asking really is, is uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what, essentially what is our minimum viable product? What's something we can put out there and show, yeah. look, this is going to work or, or it's not going to work or, or at least have some good data to, 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 to answer that question. And I think in our case, the reason, um, so doing essentially a three-day hackathon, which, which would be what that is, is something we thought about. Um, and my problem with it is that I don't think it would, sh I don't think, so let's say it were successful, I don't think that would prove very much. Let's say it were not successful, I don't think that would prove very much. So I think the difficulty here is that <coughs> that example as, as demonstrated or as iterated wouldn't get at whether or not Blue Seed would be successful because Blue Seed is doing some, it's actually creating an entire community, is finding interesting startups from around the world, is getting these equity positions. None of that would make sense in a, in a, in a three-day hackathon or even a week-long hackathon. So I, I, I have thought about that a lot and we've actually spoken with our ship broker. We have a ship broker down in Miami who's, who's presented us with a lot of those ships that you saw and, and is also working, was looking at a charter for such an event. And um, we gave it a lot of thought. It's, it's actually, uh, it's, uh, the difficulty here is that um, it's, it's just not, it doesn't seem to me like something which could eventually end up proving the model. And so it would be more of a marketing uh, demonstration. So it would be saying, look, here's a bunch of people out on the ocean doing this, this, quote unquote, which is just hacking and creating, doing stuff for three days on a computer. Um, can they do it? Yes. Uh, were we able to find enough people to, to go out there on a ship and, and do this for three days? Yes. Um, but I, I, I don't think that that would demonstrate very much. So, it, and I, I don't know that at this point we need the marketing. Um, it could be that we do. It could be that we have a, we, we still have you know a lot of difficulty convincing investors and investors would want to th see a three-day hackathon, um, but uh, but I'm not convinced of that. I'm not convinced of that enough to spend three months uh, putting together that sort of endeavor, whereas I could have been spending those three months finding uh, the 25 million. Uh, I, I would like to add something else to this. I mean, in the context of min uh, seasteading, I think uh, blue seed. Uh, there is also minimal viable product for seasteading as well. This is an interesting point. And having a cruise uh, would not really, uh, being on a cruise, even two month cruise, would not really address this. Because what we're trying to do with the Blue Seed is not just to address the visa issues, but to create, in a sense, a precedent, very legitimate precedent for seasteaders. That's one. And in a sense, a new way of doing business as well. And for that to happen, as Max mentioned, you need to do a real thing. Now, this is not to say that there are no ways of de-risking this or minimizing necessary investments. One could partner with the existing cruise line, where instead of uh, chartering a vessel for a week or two, we could get a vessel for longer periods of time and have a partnership with them where we, we would do some of the uh, revenue sharing or something like that, so they would take care of the, the logistics related to maritime operations. That's possible, but still, I, I think it would be in our interest to do the, uh, in a sense, minimum viable product for seasteading, if possible. And uh, just to add one more thing to that, what people, a lot of people would consider our biggest risks are, for example, um, will, will Customs and Border Protection really think, will it really feel comfortable with people coming in and out all the time on a business and tourist visa? 
even though they're not working in the country, they're working on the ship, etc. So what will our relationship with Customs and Border Protection be like? What will our relationship with the media and policymakers, like I, I was saying, one of our, our, I think our biggest, the most Absolutely. important core aspect of this business is the political aspects of this business. So how will they react to this? And I don't feel that, that your suggestion would test that, which to me is the actual risk and limiting question when it comes to Blue Sea. So again, it's, it would be a good marketing example. It would show um, people are interested in being on a ship and working on a computer, um, but I don't think it would get the chance to test whether or not startups could possibly be successful in that environment and the whole legal apparatus and the political questions that are the, the heart of the matter. Um, sort of like a comment first. Uh, one thing you guys didn't bring up is the, the metaphor of the dorm room. At least you didn't do it too strongly. And, and you can sort of em emphasize the coolness factor that um, so it's a little bit be like a, a dorm room on steroids. You have a ship full of very productive, very enterprising, very creative people. And uh, you know, Facebook, Google, and probably Yahoo started in dorm rooms at Stanford. Um, my question for you is, um, do any of the uh, financials or success of existing land-based uh, startup incubator, tech incubators, uh, do you have any numbers from that that would apply to, to what you guys are doing? Um, it's, not, it's not purely analogous, but I'm curious if you have some numbers based I on that. Um, so there is a, uh, so Jeff, there is a recent article in Forbes um, on the top startup incubators that kind of addresses that question. A lot of the startup top incubators, um, whether that be tech stars, prefer to keep their numbers in-house as to valuation. They'll publish figures like 93% of our startups are still around, but they won't give numbers on valuation. The, har the, the, one har the most key hard number that we have is Y Combinator, y Combinator who um, says that their startups are worth $7.4 billion as of the last valuation, which is an average valuation of $45 million. Um, if you look at their uh, startup pool, the average uh, lifespan is 2.5 years, so we're we're pretty excited about those numbers. Yeah, so I, I think I think somebody could could ask what what is the um, so so relative to Y Combinator, how 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 yeah. good are we going to be, <laughs> right? And that's the hard question, right? I don't know. Is, is it going to be half as good? Is it going to be just as good? Is it going to be a third as good? That's yeah. that's the difficult question. Yes, are we better than Paul Graham? Yeah, so <laughs> better. can foreigners do Y Combinator? Hmm? Can foreigners? Participate in Y Combinator? No. no. Yeah, I was gonna say it, it's well, they do accept foreign applicants. They just um, don't want to deal with the visa stuff. Like there are visa problems. Yeah. yeah. So like if you if you talk yeah. to Y Combinator about this. Yeah, if and and actually they they. Michael, you, you question, oh yeah yeah. The question was, um, uh, does Y Combinator accept or or deal with uh, foreigners and people with visa issues? And <laughs> the answer is they actually publicly say, if you have a visa problem, don't come to us. We're not going to help you in any way. So we would we would certainly be able to capture a lot of fruit that they, they don't have access to. <laughs> um, <Apples>. George? <laughs> oh, Joe, I'm oh. sorry. I, I didn't see you at the mic. You're next, Joe. I, I got you next. <laughs> sorry about that. I just wanted to pick up on, on John's point about the minimum viable product. Uh, and the cruise ships that you're talking about are larger and therefore more expensive. Uh, if there was, for example, just hypothetically, uh, if a smaller vessel, say 275 foot maybe, <laughs> were to become available, uh, and I understand the issues of, of size and motion and comfort, uh, there are a large number of, of motor yachts in that size. Not a large number, but there's a bunch of them, 200, 300 foot motor yachts. And there is technology that goes a long ways towards solving the problem of the agonizingly slow roll that that's so discomforting. Uh, you know, have you explored the possibility of of that avenue as uh, well, it's you know, maybe one tenth the initial uh, capital investment? We, and, and we have, we, of course, we have. I mean, as you know, it's easier to raise. Five million than it is to raise 50 million. I mean, it's just a fact of life. So therefore, we need to do whatever we can to minimize the cost. You mentioned the motion and, and seasickness and everything else. So uh, we are limited to a certain extent about the location of our proposed location. 
We are talking about Silicon Valley. So this vessel needs to be close to Silicon Valley. And as such, needs to be able to withstand and properly, in a sense, accommodate people living in such a place. Uh, here, there are some waves which are fairly big, in a sense. We don't have hurricanes. We don't have you know uh, awful conditions. But it's not a it's not a lake, in a sense. It's not a gulf or whatever a good example is. So size matters. It matters a lot for uh, issues related to comfort. So uh, I would say that's one. Two, uh, it's a business question too. We're talking about economies of scale. So how many people will be able to, to house in a smaller vessel? Let's say it's a half a size, probably half as many, which means that uh, creating this supply chain and creating this whole system that we are proposing to create maybe wouldn't be economically uh, feasible or viable. So you have two constraints here. The kind of physical constraints related to the environment, just the na nature, and the business constraints. I mean, would it be in our interest to do that, considering what else we have to create? I mean, ferries, for example. Would it be economically viable to just ferry two, three, five individuals? So, so these are the questions that are really, really serious. But you know, in a nutshell, we will do whatever we can to minimize the cost. But these are the constraints we have to live with, in a sense. Thank you. Joe? Why are so many U.S. companies interested in renting space on Blue Seed? This is Jeff's point. Uh, neatly summarized, the Max can adjust. It's coolness factor. We internally call it coolness factor, but this is what they told us. We asked them this question. Why do you want to come? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's exposure to the ideas and the people and, and the the sort of collaborative environment that they're going to have on board. So when, when we talked before about um, uh, the fact that it's going to be a curated environment and a, the, only the most awesome and interesting startups and a lot of people doing that, uh, for example, it's not just startups that are going to be on board. We're also <laughs> reserving a certain number of spaces for yeah. what we're calling the enhancer segment. And enhancers are groups such as uh, research organizations, so the Monterey Bay Research uh, Institute is looking to have a, a spot on board. Academic groups, um, the Haas School of Berkeley wants to potentially have a, like a, a number of students on board. So it's kind of like a, I like to think it's sort of sort of like a startup zoo. So you have like you have like the uh, you have the Berkeley I students like, like pointing and you know oh look at the startups all working hard and you're just, you're chugging away in their computers. Um, I also sort of uh, have this terrible. I had a nightmare once of like. Uh, investors coming in from from China or something, and they they sort of see all the startups working, ah. and you know they point and they talk about the startups. And I'm but, gonna be really being not PC here, right? But by the way, anyway. it's not a nightmare. I mean, it is a nightmare in Max's mind. But some of those would be willing to pay good money to have a chance to spend a week or two in this environment. That's we true. actually uh, <laughs> we heard serious <laughs> suggestions from German uh, executives uh, that would like to do this. They have this Mittelstadt. They are very conservative, and they would like to experience something new and exciting. And they would, I, I mean, yeah, it could be a nightmare in one way, but we could make a little bit of money doing that. Just a zoo element, and <laughs> take it, monetize it. Maybe we should stop aspect. using that term, right? I, I talk about the political stuff. That's, no, I'm shooting myself in the foot. Here. Speaking of political stuff, is there any incentive to get out from under regulatory burdens, or does that even work? Which ones? Which what regulatory burdens, Joe? Say you're a biotech firm and you're. It's too dangerous for Blue it, it all. I think it all depends on what is uh, what's politically palatable, but has been held back by silly legislation, such as the visa issue. Um, uh, our our general approach here is to be more on the sort of conservative side of saying, you know, let's not venture out too far. We're already making an interesting venture out in a particular direction, which is immigration issues, specifically related to entrepreneurs and visas. So uh, we don't want to try to bite off more than you can chew at once. Um, uh, so so the default here is probably not. But you know, I, I don't want to say for sure. So I, I'm curious, what do you, do you have any plans about two kinds of things? One is real extreme medical emergencies and extreme um, matters that, I mean, like criminal matters. So somebody has a heart attack on board and then somebody shoots somebody on board. I mean, a <laughs> I thousand that. people, you know, or 1,500 people, something's gonna happen sooner or later, and we'll obviously have 
PR implications and all that stuff. So criminal. what do you do? And let me you adjust have the, a certain legal, yeah. what is the legal environment? Well, let me adjust the environment and payment. And this is legal, legal question, which is intimately linked to the aspirations of seasteading movement, I would say. This is one of the aspects <laughs> where Blue Sea truly has an opportunity to test some of the models, in a criminal domain especially, because commercial, commercial disputes are, are going to be taken care mm -hmm. of uh, via arbitration and other mechanisms which are awesome. We don't have to innovate too much there. But the criminal related issues is, is a field for us, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a rich field because uh, examples exist. Cruise lines and ancient maritime rules uh, basically do have, do cover this field. You know, what happens when somebody kills, or, I mean, that's a horrible example, or stealing or fighting or whatever. Uh, captains have a, a lot of power and crew they have a quasi-judicial powers. Flag state also has a lot of power as well, at least on paper. Uh, now the problem is that a lot of these flag states are not that powerful to, to kind of assert their jurisdiction. And uh, so there's an opening for us, for Blue Sea, to create a framework or set of rules that would address, maybe not too directly criminal, but in, in a way uh, address some of these issues that you mentioned, you know, what happens if somebody beat somebody up or steals a laptop or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for a true seasteading uh, move, or in a sense, legal move, to, to happen. And uh, uh, I mean, the, the heart attack, that's, that's a very serious issue. Uh, I think our plan is to connect with insurance companies and take care of that via, again, existing channels, because we need to minimize that uh, uh, risk. I mean, it would be horrible for somebody to just die on our vessel would be a PR nightmare, disaster. It would basically kill our model. So we need to do whatever we can to address it. So a lot of, a lot of times, um, a lot of times the question is how does, it, how does the existing cruise line industry deal with this? Yeah. And cruise lines, um, part of the insurance that they themselves have is insurance that pays when an issue like that happens, pays them if the person who had the problem can't end up paying in some way or other. Um, so there are, uh, and of course has to pay them for things like medical evac, has to pay for the emergency room in the hospital in, a, in the nearby coastal state, which obviously here is not, you know, not in question which one it would be, but for a cruise line it does become an issue. You know, if they're out in the Caribbean, where does a person go? Do they go to this island, that island? This island doesn't have a good hospital system, that one does. It's complicated. Um, but there are, there are systems that essentially done through insurance that, that cover that. Okay, we have time for one more. Who's the most wanting to ask a question here? All right, back there. Thanks. Uh, let's say you fill the boat with companies that only pay rent and don't want to give out any equity <laughs> stakes. What kind of rents would you need to charge them so that it's still an interesting investment? So that Blue Seed is still an interesting investment. What would you call an interesting investment? Uh, so that you convince an investor to go put the, the amount of capital that you need. Oh, you couldn't do it on rent alone. I don't think. So that you can is. make a profit on rent, but the problem is, again, you need, you're going so far up the stream that unless you can show an enormous profit, unless you can show lots of money being made, it doesn't make sense. Got it, so basically the Y Combinator part of your business is essential. If you take that away, it well, does. We still make a profit. I mean, Sam can, Sam can tell you more, well, but we that, still That's the point, we take, a, yeah, hmm? we, take, we take a profit. Our goal is to cover our operational expenses via rent and associated sources of revenue. So, you know, then the question is, about these hypothetical investors, would they be willing? Maybe some would, but uh, I think the sexiest component of our plan is connected with, with startup equity, so I would say. So does that mean it'd be a requirement if I want to be on Blue Seed, I have to give out equity? Unless you're an enhancer, yes. Y yeah, uh, just, so just some of the kind of numbers so we can throw out there. Uh, we're, aver we're going to be charging an average of $1,600 per startup per month. Per you, person. Per person. Per person, excuse me. And now, if that now if you multiply that by twelve months, a thousand people, right? That you're gonna you're ending up ballpark twenty million dollars per year, which is a good amount of money, but you need that to pay your operational expenditures, which are going to be in that same range. So now you know, what do you want to make as profit? You know, if you want to double the rents, thirty two hundred dollars a month, you know, then then you're making twenty million dollars a year. Okay. But the, the Y Combinator type exits, right? if you're looking at valuations of $45 million per startup, that, that looks a lot more attractive. And that kind of feeds back into what Max is talking about. 
find a business model that's going to make you a lot of money. And, and also just remember that startups are cash poor and equity rich. But if that's your yeah. target market, it, just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to charge them really high cash prices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it would uh, negatively impact our... In fact, we've been talking a little bit about the idea of having a uh, some way of, of, of directly putting some money into some of the startups that we find very promising and very interesting on Blue Sea that haven't gotten funding either somewhere else. In other words, something having to do with a venture fund. And the reason for that is, again, that that rent component is not what's not what's interesting here. The, the equity component is what's interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, any one of us can do the math, right? We mentioned $45 million of an average exit uh, from Y Combinator. If we have 300 startups on board and they last an average of a year, and we say that we're, what, a third as good as Y Combinator, um, that's, uh, that's three, uh, at 6.5% equity approximately. That's approximately $300 million per year of profit on that vessel. So that's the kind of numbers we're talking about, not $20 million in rent.